Just wanted to welcome you all to last lecture. Um, my name is Maggie Shawley, and I'm the chair of this year's last lecture series committee. And it's my honor to welcome you on behalf of the Alcala chapter of Mortarboard and the USB Humanity Center. I'm so excited to introduce our speaker tonight and give you a little background on Mortarboard. I also just wanted to thank everyone for being here tonight. You're all a part of our first ever online last lecture, and it means a lot to us that you've come to join to enjoy this lecture in a new format. So just a few logistics. Um, if everyone wouldn't mind turning off their video when Dr. Wanick starts speaking until the end of the lecture, um, we just want to preserve bandwidth and it seems like turning off video is gonna be the best way to do that. Um, after the lecture, we'll facilitate a question and answer session and you're welcome to turn on your video and audio and ask a question, but we ask that you save all your questions to the end. I'd also like to thank the USD Humanity Center for co-sponsoring this lecture. The Humanity Center is dedicated to the exploration of the human condition and the limitless ways in which human beings understand and interact with our world. And this lecture series embodies that mission. We're extremely grateful for their partnership. So just a little background on Mortarboard. Mortarboard is a national honor society that recognizes college seniors for distinguished achievement in scholarship, leadership, and service. Mortarboard began in 1918 as the first national organization honoring senior college women. It was opened to men in 1975, retaining as part of its purpose to promote and advance the status of women, and later expanding to promote equal opportunities among all people. Mortarboard members have a lifetime commitment to the ideals of Mortarboard, scholarship, leadership, and service. The USD Mortarboard chapter, the Alcala chapter, was formed in October 2000 by Judith Lewis Lowe. The National Mortarboard Leadership awarded our chapter the Ruth Weimer Mount Award for Chapter Excellence in 2006, and each year since then, our chapter has been honored to be recognized as one of the top chapters nationally. Mortarboard has be began hosting the last lecture series at USD in the fall of 2010. The series is inspired by Dr. Randy Posh's last lecture at Carnegie Mellon on the topic of achieving your childhood dreams. Dr. Posh delivered this lecture while terminally ill, but thankfully our speaker tonight is healthy. The goal of our last lecture series is to provide an opportunity for a distinguished faculty member to consider what they might say when giving a lecture as if it were their last. So now I'm honored to introduce our speaker for the evening, Dr. Rebecca Wanick. Dr. Wanick earned her bachelor's degree in psychology from the University of Illinois and her master's and PhD in psychology from the University of California, San Diego. She's been teaching at USD since the fall of 2012. Dr. Wanick's main in areas of interest are social psychology, social cognition, and gender. The focus of her master's work was developing the subordination reactivity hypothesis to explain health disparities across genders based on differences in relationship-based power. And her doctoral work focused on exploring social comparison and body image. In addition to her courses at USC, she spent the last several years supervising student research on a variety of topics within the psychological sciences. Dr. Wanick was selected in the fall by mortar board members to speak this evening. And while the transition to online learning has been challenging for everyone, Dr. Wanick specifically took time out of her schedule while transitioning five courses to an online format to make sure that this lecture could still happen despite the circumstances. She's prepared an outstanding lecture and agreed to speak today with great enthusiasm during these unprecedented times. Dr. Wanick is a renowned teacher here at USD and was honored with the Faculty Award for Exceptional Teaching in 2016. She was also nominated for the Outstanding Undergraduate Research Mentor Award in 2017 and for the Women of Impact Award from the USD Women's Center for the past three years. Dr. Wanick is well loved by all of her students, with one student of many who she's had a lasting impact on saying, her in-class lectures are the most entertaining I've ever experienced, and she ensures that the audience is engaged in learning the entire time. I've never learned more about cognitive psychology and life in general from any singular professor at USD. Outside of the classroom, Dr. Wanick also enjoys writing. She's written five novellas and one novel, and her and her twin sister are currently working on a murder mystery trilogy together. It goes without saying that Dr. Wanick's had a wide-reaching impact on the USD community, and we're extremely excited to honor her as our lecturer this evening. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Rebecca Wanick. Thank you very, very much. So I would like to just begin by saying again, thank you to Maggie and all of the members of Mortarboard and the Humanities Center for organizing this lecture and for figuring out a way to make it happen as we transitioned remotely. And I also want to thank them for the honor of being asked to speak. So I do have to share that when I got the emails letting me know that I had been nominated to give the lecture, I was pretty sure that it was sent in error. And a slight delay in responding when I accepted had me nearly convinced that they were feverishly behind the scenes trying to figure out how to tell me that they had made a mistake. But here we are, and I do feel truly honored to have this opportunity. I had chosen the topic of my talk well before the current 
situation existed, but I think that my message is still fitting and hopefully one that's worth sharing. So I want to express my sincere appreciation that all of you have taken time out of your schedules to attend this lecture, and I will do my best to try to make sure that this is not a wasted hour. As the title of the talk indicates, I will be sharing with you some ideas related to what I view as the most important experiences that I've gone through, which have helped me to become a better version of myself, which is to say more resilient. But it's subtitled my path towards resilience for a reason, and that's to indicate from the outset that I recognize that I'm not yet fully there, that I'm still a work in progress. So in this talk, I will draw from my own experiences and share insights that I have gained, but I want to acknowledge that these insights could not have happened on their own. Some of the ideas that I share, unsurprisingly, from academic sources, from researchers and philosophers, some ideas are old and some ideas are newer. Some sentiments are things that I have gleaned from my large collection of exercise DVDs. Yes, I'm old enough that I still buy and use DVDs. Um, and through those DVDs, my unofficial life coach, Jillian Michaels. Some of what I'll share I've gathered from therapists, some from students, some from friends, some from relatives, and many, of course, from people who I will never meet. But as I move forward, I will try to give credit to these sources when I can, but I just want to preface the talk by highlighting that I would be nothing, I would have nothing to say without the influence of so many other people, and unfortunately I will not be able to give them all credit individually. But with that said, let's get started. So education, exercise, and experience with failure. Why these three things? Well, education is hard, exercise is hard, and experiencing failure is hard. And that's where I want to start because I think it's a really great place to start with something that we all know and are acutely reminded of right now. Life can be hard. So life is hard. Fortunately, it's not always hard. Some days are harder than others, but we get a lot of breaks along the way and we have a lot to enjoy. But that doesn't hide the fact that life is hard and we have to learn to deal with it, to push through. But dealing with it, that's also really hard. And the playing field isn't equal. Some of us have more resources to deal with the hardships that we face than others, and that's part of what makes life so hard, is that it's also unfair. But because it's hard, because it's unfair, we might be attracted to things like taking the easy way out and coasting. These are sentiments that we can all recognize in ways that we try to avoid hardship. And we gravitate there because people always say, life is hard, so why make things harder? But I wanna tell you that from my perspective, this is the wrong way to approach things. We should value the things that are hard, appreciate the things that are hard, and move towards rather than away from the things that are hard. Because in my view, if things aren't hard for you on a regular basis, then you're doing something wrong. If you aren't confronted with challenge regularly, then you're making a mistake. Or at least you're not doing anything that's going to help you grow because you cannot change, you cannot learn, and you cannot improve without putting in effort, facing what is hard, and accepting the challenges in life. So I told my sister that I was working on this talk, and she sent me a quote that she came across from Thomas Edison. Opportunity is missed by most people because it is dressed in overalls and looks like work. How true. We overlook it, we shy away from it, and we can miss opportunity because it comes couched in a challenge. It entails doing something that's difficult. And if you aren't oriented towards accepting challenge on a regular basis, then you're even more likely to miss it. But people always say, well, who wants to deal with what's hard? When something is difficult, it doesn't make us feel good. We might fail, and experiencing failure is unpleasant. Facing a challenge, struggling, these are things that make us realize that we have limitations. And who wants to be confronted with their limitations? Shouldn't we try to avoid feeling bad in favor of feeling good? Who would want hardship over ease? Well, I do. And I hope that by the end of this discussion, you will too, at least a little bit more than you already might. Because you see, I mentioned at the beginning that to give this lecture is an honor and a privilege, but I also feel a sense of responsibility. I feel responsibility to use this time as if it was my last lecture, to leave you with something to think about, to make things a little bit hard for you, to challenge you. 
to hopefully present you with some ideas that might help you orient or reorient towards improving your ability to flourish. So I'm not going to be saying anything that's completely novel. You can just think of it as a remastered re-release of a classic. But ultimately, I hope that you are challenged at least a little bit to think and think deeply about who you are, the choices that you make, and who you want to be. Because that self-analysis, which also is hard, is the only way to grow. So I hope that you have at least one strong reaction to something that I say. And then in life more generally, you have strong reactions frequently. The key to strong reactions is not in stifling the experience, in what, it's in what we do next, how we deal with those strong reactions. And in many cases, it makes sense to try to control our response because strong reactions can prompt strong action, sometimes inappropriately. So we must always be mindful that there is a time and a place for certain types of expressions. And so when I say have strong reactions, I don't mean use those strong reactions to then dictate your behavior, at least not in the immediacy. When you let something out, you should let it out with consideration for where you are and who you're with, with what will be productive and what will be unproductive in mind. But if something makes you angry, get angry. If something makes you sad, get sad. You have these strong emotions and you should experience them fully. Don't run away from them. Experience them. Life is hard, remember? And if we're doing something right, we shouldn't always feel content and happy. Negative emotions are good and they are valuable and they can be reminders to engage in self-reflection. For me, whenever I have a strong negative emotion, I try to figure out where is it coming from. I always ask myself, why? Why am I having this reaction? But more importantly, why am I having this reaction so strongly? And figuring this out can be tricky because we oftentimes wanna place the blame for strong negative reactions on other people. For example, if you feel angry after someone says something, the easy way out is to blame them and their words. But in reality, we need to remember that you are the source of the emotion, and so you need to look at yourself too. Blaming other people is a defensive strategy that prevents us from seeing that it's often not really about the other person, it's really about us. Now, I'm not saying that people don't say awful and inflammatory things. They do, and unfortunately, we have lots of examples of this. But regardless of what someone else does or says, don't forget that you are the lens through which the reaction is generated. And so just to give you an example that comes from academics, because of course I'm a professor. <laughs> so let's take something many of us are familiar with, getting a bad grade. So getting a bad grade is hard. It's unpleasant. It challenges us. And many times we take that strong reaction and we blame the instructor. We get angry that we didn't get the grade that we think that we deserve. We think things like, well, that exam was unfair. They graded that paper unfairly. This professor is just too hard. Now, I'm not saying that it's true in all cases, but in many cases, a large part of the real reason why we have such a strong negative reaction to a bad grade is that it signals something about us. We might not know as much as we thought we did. We might not have worked as hard as we needed to. We might just not be as good at this subject as we think we are. We have limitations or we were underprepared. Recognizing this is the thing that's the most unpleasant and it presents us with a challenge. Well, that's fantastic, I say, right? Grab that challenge. That bad grade is life's way of saying, get moving, muster up the extra effort, work harder. Think about all of the things that you value in life. Would you value them if they were easy for everyone to attain? Things have value often because they require hard work, because they are difficult to get. You really have nothing to feel good about if you get something that you didn't work for. And you should be furious with professors who don't challenge you, who don't make things hard, because they are failing to help you flourish. So I'm building to an idea that's similar to a concept that Nassim Taleb writes about in his book, Anti-Fragile. And I might not be using his term in the exact same way that he does, but I'm going to borrow it here. The general idea is that there are many things, many systems, which require challenge and stressors to learn, to grow, to adapt, and to get stronger. And we, the systems that we call individuals, are the same. Without those challenges, without dealing with things that are hard, 
we grow weak and unable to respond effectively to what life has to offer. So don't be overprotective of yourself by avoiding that which is hard. And you're not doing anyone else a favor if you're being overprotective of them. I try to implement this in my classes, as many of my students know, but I also operate by this principle in my own life. And I try to challenge myself every single day. And one of the ways that I do this is with exercise. It's a challenge both physically and mentally, and I use it to help myself become stronger, to become more resilient. So pushing yourself physically is a challenge for everyone, but exercise is an important challenge for me because I have asthma. And I grew up with very, very severe asthma, having frequent attacks and multiple hospitalizations. I think I was probably one of the first people to have an at-home nebulizer, and my doctor was definitely on speed dial to supplement my normal extensive medical regimen with emergency medication when things got really bad, which they often did. And so I tell you this only because it sets the stage for my experience with exercise. When I was a child, my allergist told me that although I could be active, I should limit my running. And in fact, I had a medical note to excuse me from running in gym class. So as a consequence of growing up believing that running was bad for me, I shied away from it. But as I got a little bit older, I started to think to myself, I know there are people with asthma who run. I'm gonna see if I can do it too. And when I started out, it was terrible. I couldn't even jog. And when I say jog, I mean fast walk <laughs> for a half mile without feeling like I was going to collapse. But I kept with it. And eventually I was able to work my way up to running sustained seven and a half minute miles for six whole miles, which I know to some people is not all that impressive, but for me as an old lady with asthma, I thought that was pretty good. I knew I was never gonna win, win any races, but that was fine. I could get better, I could be a little bit better than I was the day before. Was it easy? Of course not. Anyone who has ever trained to become a distance runner knows how hard it is and many people have trained much much harder than I have but I'm telling you that running is extra excruciating when your lungs don't work right part of the way that I worked to build up my stamina with running was by mixing in other exercise and I mentioned Jillian Michaels at the beginning as sort of my unofficial life coach so back when I was in high school I had all of these VHS tapes of buns and abs of steel I never acquired buns and abs of steel, and obviously VHS tapes have gone by the wayside, so I needed to update my collection. So I bought a few DVDs from Jillian Michaels, and when I first started trying to do them, they were almost impossible for me. I'd put one in, I'd try it, I would get frustrated, and I would start crying, because that's what I do when I get frustrated, I cry. It's very, very therapeutic. Anyone who knows me, for more than two weeks has probably seen me cry. <laughs> it's something I do quite often, but I'd want to stop. But all of these DVDs are structured on incremental growth. Each one of them has exercises that have multiple levels of difficulty, and she's always telling you throughout ways that you can modify if you need to make it a little bit easier. And so I had to remind myself that if other people could do it, so could I. And I had to start somewhere, because if I never got started, I was never going to get any better. I might never be great. I might never be able to do the whole thing. And I will readily admit that there are some of those DVDs that I still cannot do level three on, but I've definitely improved. So I kept at it and I kept getting better. And as I got better, I had to buy new workouts because the old ones were becoming less challenging as a way to keep pushing myself to move forward until eventually I did buy one and I was able to do it all the way through the first time. <laughs> to me, that was a gigantic accomplishment and something that I never would have gotten to experience if I had given up from the beginning. But one of the other reasons why I bring these up is because mixed into the workouts are some great messages that connect with what I'm trying to suggest about orienting yourself towards challenge. So for example, in one of them, she says, don't tell me that you can't. If you wanna fight for your limitations, then guess what? You get to keep them. And I think to myself, how true. Every time I think I can't, I can't do that. I'm not going to be able to get it done. I try to remember those words. Don't fight for your limitations. Don't work hard to keep yourself down. Fight to keep yourself moving forward. 
If you're going to fight, make it a fight that pushes you to improve. Don't start with, I can't. Start with, I can, and know that it's going to be challenging, but trust that accepting the challenge is the only way to get there. So another lesson that I take from her workouts is to always be working in the learning zone. Work in the learning zone with anything that you do. So I apply this to exercise, I apply this to education, I apply this to everything in my life. Always be working to improve, to learn, to make sure that you are challenging yourself. Always work in the learning zone because it's the only way that you will ever get better. So my sister is very, very helpful and she sent me, as I was working on this talk, a speech that Denzel Washington gave a few years ago. And he says in that speech that there is no greater impediment to progress than ease. And I totally agree with him. Ease means that you are not working in the learning zone. You are not pushing yourself. Taking the easy way out doesn't push things forward and it certainly doesn't help you grow and flourish. You cannot be proud of laziness and accomplishing things that are easy because it's not really an accomplishment. We get great value psychologically out of accomplishing things. Don't deprive yourself of that. I remember a long, long time ago when I was in junior high and it was the summer, so we were on break from school. My sister and I had a friend who lived down the block who had an older sister who was in high school. And one day we were over at the friend's house and the older sister was really upset. And so we asked her, what's wrong? And she said to us in this exasperated fashion, I'm not accomplishing anything. So of course we thought this was hysterically funny at the time, but that's because we were young and dumb, right? Her exasperation was totally warranted. Placing value on accomplishing things or at minimum trying to accomplish things is of the utmost importance if you wanna to work towards self-improvement. And I find this idea that there is no impediment to progress like ease to be true in exercise. You'll never improve your stamina if you don't push yourself. You'll never increase your strength if you don't push yourself. But it's also true in education. We spend a lot of time complaining about the challenges that we're presented with in the classroom, but I say reinvest that effort in appreciating your opportunity and working to overcome the challenges instead. There's a great quote that I encountered from a very interesting book that some of you may have read called The Coddling of the American Mind by Greg Lukianoff and Jonathan Haidt. And it's a quote that they present from Van Jones, who said to students, I don't want you to be ideologically safe or emotionally. I want you to be strong. I'm not going to pave the jungle for you. Put on some boots and learn how to deal with adversity. The whole point of the gym is that there are weights there. So you see, I'm not the only person that connects education and exercise. But in all you do, push yourself physically, mentally, intellectually, emotionally, push yourself challenge yourself. There is nothing more empowering or frightening than knowing that you hold the key to your own growth, to what you will get out of life. And exercise and education, these are what I see as important keys to helping you develop your strength. And now when I'm talking about education, I'm not talking about just learning concepts that relate to the content of your courses. Of course that's important, but the most important thing that you take away from educational experiences is an approved ability to process ideas. Challenging yourself to confront things that are new, to argue a position, to think critically, to fail and start over, these are the components of education that are challenging, but they are valuable tools that you can take with you everywhere you go. Many people are familiar with the idea attributed to Buddha that your unguarded thoughts can do more harm than your worst enemy. And you can learn to guard your thoughts. You can be your own cognitive bodyguard and a challenging educational experience will help get you there. College is a time to challenge yourself to cultivate your own anti-fragility intellectually and emotionally. Put on your boots and walk into the jungle. So I wasn't always good at doing this. I remember when I was in college enrolling in a class, I think it was philosophy of mind, but the first day there was about 10 students there and I felt like everybody was talking about things that I had never heard of. They were using terminology, clearly they had information that I did not have access to. And so instead of accepting the challenge, I felt intimidated and I dropped the class. 
maybe I should have stayed. I ended up taking something else instead. And of course, I'll never know which would have been the better choice. But I want to take this opportunity to make another important point. And I mentioned at the very beginning that life is unfair and that sometimes things are harder for us than they are at other times. And some of us have more resources to deal with certain challenges than others, often through no fault of our own. So I want to say there's nothing wrong with dropping a course or deciding that perhaps now isn't the right time for this or that particular challenge. But if you're always dropping out, if you're always taking the easy way out, if you're always avoiding challenge, then you aren't doing yourself any favors. So some of you might be familiar with the singer songwriter, Ray LaMontagne. Um, in many of his songs, he has really wonderful lyrics, but I just wanna quote from him here. He says, well, I looked my demons in the eye, lay bare my chest, said, do your best to destroy me. See, I've been to hell and back so many times, I must admit, you kind of bore me. When I hear that, I think, ugh, to be that strong, to be bored by your demons, to turn and face a new challenge without fear, to look your demons square in the eye, and to challenge them right back? Well, we can all be like that, but we've got to go to hell and back, not just once, but often. The more challenges you face now, the better equipped you are to handle the ones that you will experience in the future. And I wanna take a moment to now connect with another point that I think is expressed nicely in Lukianoff and Haidt's book about being charitable. They talk about it in intellectual terms, but I'll extend it a bit. But to begin, they discuss that the principle of charity is an idea in philosophy in which you give the kindest interpretation to other people's words. So don't assume that people are trying to offend. Ask instead for clarification. Try to understand where someone else is coming from. If someone else says something that upsets you, like I said before, have your reaction, have it strongly, but remember that the reaction, your reaction, it's about you, not the other person. And you have the choice in what to do moving forward, and I hope that you would make the choice to be charitable with others and their ideas. And of course, this is not to say that I don't think that you should, shouldn't challenge people to defend their ideas, but do it in a way that's kind and not inflammatory. You should hold your well-reasoned beliefs strongly, but don't be so strong in your view that you can't listen to and process the ideas of someone else. And always, always think about not just the evidence that you have to hold your belief, but the consequences of your belief. Think about how having that belief affects others how it affects the way that you behave towards others. Because it's very, very important to recognize that life isn't about you. Or I should say, it's not just about you. If we were in an auditorium, I'd ask you to look around you, but now I'll just ask you to remember the experience of being in a crowd. And even if we're not around others in the immediate physical vicinity, we're all still sharing resources. There are a lot of people and we're all sharing things, space, Wi-Fi bandwidth, food, toilet paper. So it's not just about you. It's about everyone else too. And something that we need to remember about sharing space is that even though we might occupy the same space, no one else is looking at the world through your eyes. And as a consequence, you can't expect other people to see things in the same way that you do. And this, this is another thing that is challenging about life. We're all looking at things through a different lens. But as I've been saying, it's great because it presents us with a challenge that can prompt change. This means that you can learn from others. You can challenge yourself to take on a new perspective. You can try to see things in a new light. Talk to other people about their experiences, their perspective on things, their ideas. Learn about their demons. Before you reject a difference of opinion out of hand, try to understand where the other person is coming from. We learn from exposing ourselves to ideas and people that we disagree with. This is what a high quality liberal arts education is all about. It can be threatening and difficult, but it's very, very valuable. And speaking of threatening but valuable challenges, always think about and appreciate how your words and actions affect other people. Don't just focus on how other people affect you. Be strong enough to apologize and do it frequently. Admit your own mistakes, not just to yourself, but to others, but don't dwell on them. Be forgiving of yourself and be forgiving of other people too. 
But when I say be forgiving, I don't mean to say that there aren't or there shouldn't be consequences for our actions. There are, and we need to learn to accept this. Life is hard, life is about choices, and sometimes a hard part of life is dealing with the consequences of the choices that we have made. Right now you have choices. You have the choice to accept or run away from challenge. Part of how we run away from challenge is with blame. We often place blame on the situation or blame on other people for our behavior. I had to do that. You made me do this. As a social psychologist, psychologist, I know that some of this is true to a certain extent. Situations do have powerful effects on our behavior, but in the end, it comes down to the choices that you make. Some choices are constrained by circumstances, no doubt, but in every situation, we always have choices. When you start feeling sorry for yourself, I ask you to pause, take a look at yourself, and think about your choices. Did any of them help you get there? If so, avoid doing them in the future but mostly look forward. What choices do I have now? What choices can I make to move myself to a better place? But it's up to you to work to deal with the consequences of your choices. As a silly but illustrative example, this is something that I've noticed on the road all too often lately. If you missed your turn, please do not stop in the middle of the lane and try to get from the left lane to turn right, blocking everybody behind you. Turn left, go around the block, and reorient yourself. It's your mistake. You deal with the consequences. Don't make it everybody else's problem. Now, sometimes we are in hard positions. We're stuck in that left lane where we want to turn right, and it's because of things that are outside of our control. That's true. But life isn't fair. It's hard and it isn't fair. We've already established that. But this is actually great because that means that you have an extra challenge. You get to become even stronger. And I get it, getting stronger from hardship isn't easy. We often struggle to deal with things and we struggle to cope. But this is the very reason why I say that you should seek out challenges when you can. Because if you are seeking them out, then you can make sure that they are not more than what you can handle. And you use them to better prepare yourself for the challenges that you don't see coming. So I mentioned Van Jones's point about the gym earlier. He was talking about education, but I want you to think about everything in life like that. When you first start working out, when you go to the gym, you don't pick up the heaviest weight from the rack. You probably can't even lift it, to be honest with you. You start small. In the gym, you have control over your challenges. You start with lighter weights and you gradually increase. Life is the same. The more you seek out challenge, the more control you have over pushing yourself bit by bit to get stronger in delaying, in dealing with obstacles and hardship. And you need to build that strength to be prepared because life likes to play dirty. Life throws curveballs, and for me, I oftentimes feel like life gets in some good sucker punches. So about 10 months ago, I started to experience a lot of pain and I couldn't recover from my workouts. My muscles were always sore and my hands and feet were hurting me, tingling and numb. Sometimes it was hard to walk. Sometimes it was hard to even type. And as a consequence, I had to confront two new challenges. One was that exercise went back to being very difficult. And the second was in dealing with the medical establishment. So trying to get doctors to believe that your pain and fatigue aren't the result of stress or depression when you're a middle-aged woman is a nearly impossible task. Never mind that I had a PhD in psychology, I was talked down to by nearly every physician that I encountered. One even patronizingly tried to explain to me what anxiety is. I knew they were wrong, and knowing that they were wrong, I had to keep fighting. I fought for different doctors. I even switched to a new medical plan until finally, just last month, I got a partial answer, and I was right. But what I'm left with now is the pain and the difficulty when I try to be physically active, but I keep going. I haven't stopped working out, but I've had to modify. I can't run anymore, but I do different things. And just because I keep going, this doesn't mean that I didn't take some time to be upset, that I don't wallow a bit every now and then, that I still don't get down. But because life's punches can set you back, life hits hard, often when you don't expect it, these things will do less damage to you if you've prepared yourself to be resilient. 
if I wasn't working so hard on being strong prior to this experience, who knows where I'd be now? I often get through hard times by reminding myself that life doesn't get to win. It, it might knock me down, it might make things harder than I think I can deal with, but it doesn't get to win. I get to decide when I'm done, and it's not now. If things are difficult, acknowledge that they are difficult, but don't stay there. Don't adopt a defeatist perspective or allow yourself to play the victim. When you view yourself that way, you aren't challenging yourself. And guess what? You get to stay where you are. So I'm not saying that you have to do everything on your own. And I'm not saying that we aren't sometimes victimized. You should reach out to others for help when you need it. And as many of us know, sometimes it's the reaching out for help that's the hard thing. We all need a little extra help sometimes, but that's why we have trainers. That's why we have coaches and therapists and professors, people to help guide and support us through those challenges. I myself struggled with crippling depression in high school all the way up through and beyond graduate school. And I wouldn't have gotten through it without the help of many, including my family, my friends, and an amazing therapist. And she challenged me. She made me struggle harder, but it was worth it. And I take what I learned from that experience with me everywhere I go. It's now part of my strength. And I want to come back to this idea of being charitable because helping others is about being charitable. We see a lot of examples of charity and care for others right now, people stepping up to help out in times of need, and that's wonderful. But unfortunately, we also see a lot of selfishness. People stockpiling toilet paper and hand sanitizer and reselling it for a high profit. That's taking advantage of others and it's incredibly selfish. So I'm bringing this up only because many of you out there are leaders already or will go on to be leaders. And I wanna challenge you to avoid accepting a leadership role unless you are oriented towards care. Research shows that leadership and power tend to draw people with certain types of characteristics, narcissism, for example, and this creates toxic environments. It's often hard for truly caring people to move up the ladder because they tend to give credit to others and work behind the scenes. So we all need to work on being better to see who's really doing the hard work, who really cares about other people, and put more of those people in leadership positions. And if you do find yourself in a leadership role, don't forget about the many people who helped to get you there. Be the first, not the last, to sacrifice. Don't ever ask for more than you are willing to give. And in fact, give more. You should give more because you have more. But caring for people and being an effective leader also means challenging them. Challenge the people you lead to make the most of their talents. If you're working on anything, work to always go the extra mile. Strive to always do your best. Show up. Don't miss the opportunities that life offers you. Put on your overalls and your boots and get to it. The kind of hard work that I'm talking about requires incremental change. And I think that this is harder to cultivate now because many people have stopped placing value on delaying gratification. We can get pretty much whatever we want whenever we want it. And this is making us weak and lazy. And I believe that it feeds into a decrease in hope about the future. Why would we ever expect the future to get better if no one is willing to work hard? If no one has the skills to push through challenge, if no one used their time in college and in life in general as a gym to strengthen their bodies, their minds, their emotions to become more resilient. Because things won't change, they won't get better unless we recognize and appreciate that making things better requires a lot of hard work, but it's worth it. There is no impediment to progress like ease. So I've mentioned several times the fact that we make choices. To help things get better, we often need to make hard choices. Making the hard choice is oftentimes one that reduces rather than increases disparity, and it's hard because it often means that you should take less for yourself. But we need to remember that it's not just about us. And if you worked hard, if you put in extra effort and succeeded, feel good, but don't keep all of the rewards for yourself. Recognize that you didn't achieve those things all on your own and other people might not have had the same advantages or challenges placed in front of them to help them flourish like you were able to. So I'm not saying that you shouldn't be proud and that you shouldn't be rewarded, but you don't get to take all of the credit. 
And this also means that people who are down don't get all of the credit or the blame for their situation either. That's why it's important to be charitable and think of others. In our lives, we will oftentimes alternate between being up and being down. When you're up, share with those who are down. You would want those who are up to do the same for you when you're down. And when you're down, remember that it's okay. You still have choices. You can feel bad, you can wallow, you can cry, I encourage it. You can get angry, do that, experience it. But challenge yourself so that you don't get stuck. And if you are stuck, ask for help. But don't forget to be thankful. Be thankful that life has given you a challenge, has put you in a position to overcome, to get stronger. So I won't bore you with all of the unpleasant experiences that I've gone through. I know other people have experienced worse and suffering isn't a contest. I don't wish my hardships on anyone, but I am truly thankful that I went through them. I feel lucky because they have made me the person that I am today. They have made me stronger and they have made me more compassionate. But I'm not perfect. I still have a lot of work to do and life will continue to put more challenges in my path. So I want to be ready. Going through hardship leaves its mark. It can give you scars, but scars make you interesting. They make you unique. I challenge you to see the value in that imperfection, to give importance to the way that the past has challenged you, and to reflect on whether you are moving toward or away from the things that you value as a result. If you've been pushed away, work hard to get back on the path to move forward. Reorient yourself towards flourishing. But don't forget the scars. The scars are what make you appealing. Think about the people that you know who've really gone through hardship. They are often the ones who have the best stories. They're tough and resilient. They've shown that they are anti-fragile. We see people with scars as cool and badass for a reason. So life has given all of us a challenge now, and it's up to us how we deal with it. There's a lot that we don't have control over, but at minimum, we have control over how we interpret and think about our situation, the choices that we make. I've mentioned therapy a couple of times, and this is what cognitive restructuring is all about. Challenging yourself to reinterpret. Be thankful that you have a place to stay, that you have something to do, that you have people who care about you. Be thankful that life is giving you an experience that will help you grow, that can push you forward, that can make you stronger. And to help, I'll share something small that I learned from my therapist. It's one of those tools that I carry with me. When I have a negative thought, she reminds me to always acknowledge it, but then decide what happens next. So let's say that something crops up. I think, oh, I'm no good, or this is just too hard. Fine, thank you, brain, for generating this, but what do I do now? Well, I can sit there and I can believe it, but whether or not it's true, I need to assess whether or not it's helpful. Is this thought helping me to move forward to what I value? Is it helping me to get stronger? If not, let it go, set it aside move on to something else. Make the choice to orient towards that which will push you forward, not hold you back. The band Blue October has a song called Fear with lyrics that are very pertinent and I encourage you to listen to it later. Many of us are experiencing a lot of fear and anxiety right now and that's okay because we still have choices. We are all strong. So in this song they say, today I don't have to fall apart. I don't have to be afraid. I don't have to let the damage consume me. Believe in yourself and you will walk. So walk, always walk, or you'll never be able to run. Put one foot in front of the other slowly if you have to, because life can be a jungle, but walk, even if it's hard, sorry, even if it's hard, especially if it's hard. Always, always challenge yourself to work in the learning zone, to try something new, to push, choose exercise, choose education, choose your own challenges, knowing that you will fail, hoping that you will fail, but be thankful for it. Every moment of every day, we have the opportunity to make choices. Challenge yourself to make the choices that will help you and those around you to become stronger, more charitable, more interesting, and consequently more resilient. Thanks. <laughs> All right, so now we have a few minutes where 
people can ask questions if you'd like. If um, if there are multiple people who want to talk, just raise your hand and like we'll try to help facilitate it. But Dr. Wanning's been nice enough to answer a few questions. I think I scared everybody. <laughs> Uh, can I actually ask a question? Yes, please. Um, first off, obviously, thank you so much for taking on this challenge and giving your last lecture. I think you did it amazingly and shared so vulnerably, and it really inspired and encouraged me to be better. Um, I was just curious, just because I know my personality. Do you have? Can you share any wisdom on kind of seeking challenges but not being reckless? If that makes sense. Sure. So I, I mean, I mentioned you know using other people to help you, and I think that one of the ways that you can check yourself is by running ideas, especially if you tend towards being a little bit reckless. Run the ideas by other people; it helps you get perspective. Um, so that would be my recommendation. Okay. So just like that importance of having a community and like trusted um, people to kind of vet things through. Exactly, okay. because other people can give you a reality check as to whether, whether or not the challenges that you're trying to take on are things that are doable, but they can also help you to figure out a more workable solution if you encounter something that is a little bit too hard. Okay, awesome. I also do want to say, um, just from your own classes and my experience with you, that you've already helped me grow so much in my resilience, so you're, you're just killing it. Awesome. Thank you. I really, really appreciate that. How do you, you, like on the flip side, how do you feel like you developed the self-awareness to recognize when a challenge is that you can handle or one that would be too much for you to cope with and you need to look back at it at a different time? And then also, would the recording of this talk be sent out so we can send it to friends and family? I think, Maggie, I think it's it's recorded, right? Yes, we're recording it. We're still trying to figure out the exact best way to distribute it. It should be available through Humanity Center, and um, we can probably get it over email to people attending as well. Okay, cool. So um, the, to, to address your question, how do, you, how do you know if something is too challenging? I, I think that, that it, it takes a lot of effort to figure out what your boundaries are. And so for me, one of the things that helped me to get to that point, like I mentioned, is therapy, but also talking to friends, talking to, to family, and really listening to other people's advice. Because other people can ha have a different perspective than you do, and they can kind of challenge you to think a little bit about, is now the right time for you to be working on this? Knowing that you are strong, but sometimes it's just not the appropriate moment. But I would say also if you feel if you feel overly frustrated, if you feel overly negative in your emotions, if you start to feel like things are too much, they probably are. So what I would say is don't give up, just dial it back. I'm, I mentioned to my classes, I'm trying to learn Mandarin, which is one of the hardest things that I've ever tried to do in my entire life. And so, of course, when I started, I sent my sister a text message and I said, this is too hard. I have to give up. <laughs> and she was like, you can't. And so what I did was I got a second language learning app. And so now I'm doing one in the morning and one in the afternoon. And so having a good trusted person that you can run things by, I think is very, very valuable because like I said, we, we can't get through challenges all on our own. Thank you. And I, I really appreciate your talk and, and how much you've helped me grow in my four years at USD. And I just know you've had a profound impact on so many of the faculty and students that you've worked with. And so I'm just really grateful that I've been able to meet you and work with you. Thank you so much, Liza. I really appreciate that. I've got a question. Um, my name is Alvin. And uh, yeah, again, I want to thank you. This has been uh, an incredible lecture to listen to. Um, 
I think it kind of relates to Liza's question, but uh, personally, when my beliefs or principles are challenged, I instinctively feel attacked. Um, mm -hmm. I hope that's natural. Uh, how do I resist reacting with my emotion without, uh, how do I resist reacting with my emotion and, and take that step back first? And how do I begin to um, make that a habit? I, my recommendation would, would be to start first with just recognizing your emotions. Um, and so the, the way that I do it is, is I, I'll always sit, say, ooh, I'm getting heated. Because we oftentimes do, we just react. And it's, it's really hard to stop yourself. But if you, even if you start the reaction, if you can catch yourself and just say, I'm sorry, I, I, I need a minute, it takes work. It's, it's something that, that you, you have to do it incrementally. So again, I would say, get somebody else to help you out. If you notice that you tend to do that a lot, then I would suggest that you have a friend and say like, hey, if you notice that I'm starting to get a little bit overheated about something, can you just kind of poke me, ask me, so count to 10 before you continue talking as a way to kind of serve as an additional reminder for you. Again, for me, it's my sister. My sister is my twin. So we, we grew up together and she's been the most amazing source of support for me, but she also helps me to check myself and I hope that I do the same thing for her. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Hi, Dr. Wanik. Hello. Hello. So um, I have a question about what your advice would be to seniors, students who are graduating this year, just to really like either de-stress or get through on with the rest of the semester and into our future careers, wherever we will be. And I also just want to say that out of all the times I've reached out to you for advice and met you on campus and talked to you through email, like this is one of the most inspiring speeches and type of lectures that you've given. And I'm really appreciative of all your hard work and compassion towards us. It helps a lot. Thank you. Um, I think my, my advice to, especially to people that are graduating, because I know it, it's, it's this daunting task of, we don't know what things are gonna be like in a couple of months. We don't know what the job situation is gonna be like. But what I would say then is focus on what you do have control over and do the things that you can. So right now we're all learning a bunch of new skills. A lot of people that didn't have the ability to make video lectures are making video lectures. Students are making video presentations. So think about all the valuable skills that you're acquiring and then look at what you do have control over. And right now what you have control over is the classes that you're working on and planning for what you can plan for. But also recognize and give yourself license to feel upset, to be frustrated, because this is frustrating. But don't stay there. Know that things will get better. They might not get better immediately, but know that they will get better. I'm like, I am living proof of the fact that things can go from very, very bad to very, very good. So one of the things that I oftentimes tell students in office hours, if they're asking about something that's troubling them, is I say, wait a week and see how you feel, if you feel the same, and then wait six months. Because in six months, whatever is the thing that's bothering you is not gonna be the same thing that's bothering you now. And sometimes we lose perspective by just focusing on what's currently going wrong in the situation. But then the second thing is always think about the things that you have, not focus on the things that you don't have. So right now I can think about a thousand things that I have to be thankful for. My job was able to go remote. I'm so fortunate. I have a place to say, I am so fortunate. I have people who care about me. I am so fortunate. And so we always have blessings. It's just working on reorienting yourself to focus on what's good, not getting stuck and focusing on what's bad. Because like I said, that doesn't help you. That doesn't move you forward. Thank you. Uh, I had a quick question. I'm Professor Wanek. Uh, I, I also wanted to thank you about for giving the speech. It was really, really inspiring. I really enjoyed every second of it. Thank um, you. 
I just had a question regarding, so I know in this might apply to some of us or maybe most of us, but when we talk about change, you know, we all have something that we want to improve on, we want to work on, that we want to change, but sometimes um, we might get pressured because um, we're concerned about what other people might think about us. So mm -hmm. how do you think is the best way we should go about tackling that? So I think always what you need to do is take a step back and, and think to yourself, whose life is it? Is it someone else's life or is it mine? What are the values that I hold and am I working towards achieving those values? And I think for college students, a lot of times they're in a difficult position because they feel like they need to do things because their parents want them to do it. But what I would say to you is, are your parents living your life? Are your parents going to be you when you're 40? No, they're not. And your friends aren't, you are going to be you. So always try to be mindful of making choices that are consistent with pushing you towards the things that you value. Thank you. I don't know if that's helpful or not. <laughs> no, no, that was great. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Um, Dr. Um, Dr. Monica, I have a question. Yes. Do you think that we're going to actually get to be 40? You and I will be 40 in a very short time. Oh, okay. Well, as long as we can get there. Booyah! That was my sister. <laughs> All right, if no one else has any questions, um, one more, one more. Oh, sweet. Um, is there or are there like key experiences that have led you to learn such a profound, like, applicable life lesson? Uh, making yeah. choices that have led to negative consequences, experiencing things that have led to negative consequences. I think honestly, I didn't know when I was growing up that I was as sick as I was, but I was a very sick child. And I think that that was like a very important experience of knowing that whatever everything, anyone else did that was easy was always going to be hard for me. So it sort of set the stage. Um, but I, I, I mean, I've, I mentioned I suffered from very, very bad depression. And I spent a lot of time focusing on all of the things that were negative and all of the things that were going wrong. And I think move, part of moving beyond being at that stage of my life was recognizing how much control I did have. And I think, again, you know, at, at the age that many of the listeners are being in college, you're at an age where you're going from being a child to being an adult. And that's a difficult transition. But the really nice thing about being an adult is that you have control. And so all of those things that bother you about needing to do this for that person or that because this person says that you need to do it, you don't have to do that when you're an adult. You get to take back control. And I think learning that you get to take back control and really just going through hard stuff is the most valuable way to get more resilient. I mean, like I said, I really feel very fortunate and lucky that I had to go through all of the stuff that I had to go through because without it, I wouldn't be the person that I am today. Absolutely. Thank you again for that. Mm -hmm. um, I have one more question. Yeah. Hi, Dr. Warner. Um, so I guess I was just wondering, how do you find the balance of um, always wanting to strive for more and always wanting to improve yourself and being satisfied with where you're at and how much you've accomplished? So I think that, that you need to take time to appreciate what you've done, but I'm honestly never satisfied because as soon as I'm satisfied, then I stop challenging myself. 
So I, I'm always looking for ways to improve. Um, I think, you know, pe people oftentimes laugh because I will for fun watch math lectures because there, I, I just feel like there's always some area where I can be adding something on. And so being, being appreciative of what you've accomplished to me is different from being satisfied. I can be satisfied that I did this thing to the best of my ability, but in terms of where I am as an endpoint, I'll never be satisfied because I could always be working to make myself a little bit better. And I think I should do that. I don't know, did you have a follow up, Maya? No, that's it. I was just wondering if it's okay to not be satisfied. Because I think that a lot of people, um, it could be seen as like, um, oh, well, then you're not happy if you're not satisfied, but I don't necessarily think that that's true. Yeah, so I, I just wanted to get your opinion. Satisfaction and happiness is the same thing. I like for, for me, I think that, that I get, I, I get happiness out of pushing myself out of accomplishing things out of recognizing that there's something that I can improve. Um, and so, so I, I'm not saying that satisfaction is a bad thing. You can be satisfied when you complete a project, but to be satisfied that I am the best that I person that I could be, I don't think I'll ever get to that point. Thank you for your question. All right, if no one else has any questions, I just, Dr. Monik wanted to give you a huge thank you from Mortarboard and from the last lecture series committee. This was such a huge thing to be able to put on and I like can't even imagine the thought that it might have not happened now. This was such an amazing lecture and we just are so, so happy that you were able to, to do this. Thank you so much. I, and, and really, I, I am very, very grateful for having the opportunity to speak. I appreciate it so much. I'm so glad that, that first email wasn't the end of <laughs> the end of this. Wasn't a mistake. <laughs> awesome. Excellent. Well, thank you to everybody for taking the time to do this. And I hope that everybody stays safe and healthy. And we'll all hope that things start to improve sooner rather than later. And we'll work on getting this lecture distributed through both like the Mortarboard and Humanity Center channels as soon as we can. And thank you everyone for attending. Yes, thank you. Thank Before you. everyone leaves, I, I want to thank both of you guys, Maggie and your whole team who did a fabulous job on all of this. Um, and also, of course, Professor Wanai for this amazing lecture.